So Huntington's disease is a condition that I've been working on for a long time now, and I could talk about it for ages, um, but I've only got a little slot this evening. So I'm going to give you a bit of a uh, highlight um, in terms of this presentation. So first of all, this is something that I'd normally play as people are walking in um, to the, the lecture theatre or the, the venue, um, but I just want to play you a little clip. So have a listen to this. This land is your land, and this land is my land, in the California, in the New York Island, in the Redwood Forest, in the Gulf Stream waters. This land was made for you and me. Okay, so I can't see the chat, but can anyone give me any suggestions of who that might be? Singing that song. It's a game of Guess the Song. And Ed, can you just tell me if anyone gets it? Deathly silence. We oh. have suggestions. I'm going to take it to a wild guess and it's not you, is it? It's not me. I wish no. it was me. No, me. well, that, that, that's me. Ooh, Woody Guthrie. Go yes, on. good work. Who was it? Who got that? Forge, one of our committee yes. members. Forge, um, good work. Yes, that is Woody Guthrie. Uh, so he was a American singer um, who sadly passed away from Huntington's disease. So it's a nice little um, kind of opener, really, um, to my talk. Um, and the thing with Huntington's disease is that although um, it is known about today, it was discovered all the way back in 1872. So we've known about this condition for a really long time. Uh, George Huntington first described Huntington's disease in his essay on chorea. Uh, and one of, of, some people say he had one publication in his entire medical career. Some people will argue it's two. Um, go with whichever, whichever makes you feel better. Um, but he described this condition of Huntington's disease in his patients in Long Island. Uh, in America, he described that he was seeing patients that were coming in showing this chorea like uh, movement, this jumping, shaking like movement. And this is why some people refer to Huntington's disease as Huntington's chorea. Now, it's not technically okay to do that anymore. It's a bit of an old fashioned term because Huntington's chorea um, suggests that chorea is the only symptom of the disease and nowadays we know that there are a lot more symptoms than just the chorea so we now call it Huntington's disease so it's a bit more accurate and um, to refer to it like that. So this is a brain scan of somebody who has Huntington's on the left there uh, and somebody without the condition on the right so you can see in terms of the pathology of the condition, it has quite a marked um, pathology in terms of the striatum. So the area of the brain that Huntington's disease affects initially, uh, right towards the middle and the center of the brain. But also you can see in this um, brain scan, there's a wider atrophy or a shrinking uh, of the brain that you can see there. And this would be somebody who's at the latter stages of the condition. And this is why it causes um, the symptoms that we see. So this is a key, a genetic uh, diagram that just shows you the inheritance of Huntington's disease because it is what we call an autosomal dominant condition. And that means that if somebody carries the gene for Huntington's disease, they will unfortunately go on to develop the condition. So that's quite rare in terms of diseases in that there are some conditions that have genes that contribute to risk uh, or may increase it by a certain proportion or percentage. But if you have the gene for Huntington's disease, you will unfortunately go on to develop the condition. And that also means that there's a 50-50 chance uh, that you may pass that disease-causing gene onto your children as well. Um, I should say, if you don't take any kind of further preventative steps, things like embryo screening, um, etc. So this is the genetic, um, across the way genetics works for Huntington's disease. And it's one of the reasons it makes it quite a unique um, condition to work with um, and to work on. So many people have described the genetic uh, in inheritance of Huntington's disease as like a flip of a coin. So 
sometimes people think it's got to do with gender it absolutely hasn't so every time um, people choose to have a, a child there's a 50 percent chance of passing that gene on so if you already have children with the gene for the condition it doesn't affect the chances of having any more and um, it's literally a 50 percent chance every time that you um potentially pass this on so here's a little video um, to show you what we call the basal ganglia. So in the, the brain right in the middle there, these are the kind of main um, area affected in Huntington's disease. And one of the reasons it's relatively tricky to treat, there are lots of reasons, um, because it affects a part of the brain that's right in the middle, right in the centre, so it's quite difficult to get to. And these are just some of the symptoms of Huntington's disease. So chorea that I mentioned earlier, that comes from the Greek word meaning to dance. You see that patients have these shaking and um, jerking like movements. But alongside those motor problems, patients also report uh, lots of cognitive symptoms and psychiatric symptoms as well. So things like um, depression and irritability, getting frustrated and, and angry um, can happen quite a lot, as well as things like poor cognitive flexibility and um, problems with thinking. So this really is a disease that affects um, lots of different aspects of function. So I think lots of people still probably think of this as a motor condition, but that's absolutely um, not the case. So you might hear of the symptoms of Huntington's disease referred to as a triad. So you've got those motor symptoms, cognitive and psychiatric symptoms, uh, because they all affect the, the patients that have this condition. But what I like to do is kind of flip this triangle on its head a little bit. Um, so it looks a bit more like this, because we know that it's the cognitive and psychiatric symptoms that actually not only impact people first in the disease progression, they can sometimes happen decades before the onset of motor symptoms. So they happen first and actually when you talk to patients and family members and carers um, who are kind of all involved in this condition, it's the cognitive and the psychiatric symptoms that actually they find much more troubling than those motor symptoms. So I find that really interesting. Um, lots of people say, you know, my the working of my brain in terms of my cognition is very personal to me. So that's why I find those symptoms more distressing and upsetting than those really obvious motor symptoms. And yes, people stare at me because I'm, I'm shaking and moving. Um, but actually, in terms of my life and my quality of life, it's those cognitive symptoms that have more of an impact. So at the end of my PhD, um, which was quite a long time ago now, I moved from the laboratory into the patient clinic because I had um, data that looked at mouse models of Huntington's disease, which suggested that cognitive training could produce some benefit uh, in terms of preventing the disease um, progressing and retraining um, the brain. So at the end of my PhD, I I did enjoy the lab, um, but I wanted to go and talk to people and engage with people who are living with this condition. It's something that I would always recommend to anyone if you are working on a condition or a disease and you haven't met people living with it, then absolutely go and, and try to um, because it will give you renewed focus uh, and certainly kind of clearer thoughts in terms of um, what you're doing and it will really put it into perspective. So at the end of my PhD, I had this data uh, and I wanted to explore it in the clinic. So I was really fortunate in that I was able to um, convince people to give me money essentially to fund that research. Uh, and I got a fellowship from the Welsh Government to take this into clinic and to do some work and some research on cognitive training in Huntington's disease. And um, by this, I really mean computer game brain training. So there's loads of computer games out there. Um, some of which, some of those companies have got into a lot of trouble for making unsubstantiated claims. It's worth noting that. Uh, but I wanted to take these computer games into the clinic and to try and see if they uh, had any impact in terms of helping people who are living with this condition. I know that computer games are just computer games and um, they're maybe not going to be the same as a, as a drug therapy but that's what I wanted to do. So Cogtrain HD was born 
And this was a home-based uh, computer game cognitive training intervention. And for me, it was really important that people were appropriately supported in doing this. We've got varying levels of digital literacy, um, not only in Wales, but across the whole of the UK and even further afield, um, particularly relevant now in the times that we're, we're in. Um, but I wanted to make sure that people were well supported. We teamed up with a company called Happy Neuron, who um, gave us the computer games. And I also um, offered people telephone or email reminders in order to undertake their brain training. So this study finished about a year ago now, and we've just submitted it for publication. And we looked at how people got on. It was a very early stage feasibility study, but we found that there was um, fair to say variable adherence to the intervention. We asked people to play these games for 30 minutes, three times a week. And we asked everybody when they signed up, how does that level of commitment sound? And absolutely all of them said, yeah, sounds fine. I'll be able to do that. No problem at all. But reality was um, out of our sample size of 30 people, less than 10 were able to adhere to the cognitive training program as we asked them to. And um, so that was quite an interesting finding. But we also learned a lot about this in terms of moving it forward. We did lots of uh, interviews with people about how they got on and how they found it. And interestingly, out of all of the people on the study, everybody chose to receive email reminders. Don't know whether it was just the prospect of me ringing them up and nagging them. Who knows? Maybe they can, can ignore those email reminders um, more readily. But yes, this is the um, Happy Neuron cognitive training uh, study that I was involved with um, for about three years and um, looking at that in the clinic. So I thought um, it might be quite fun this evening to have a little go at some brain training. So I've never done this on a Zoom call before or online. Um, so we'll see how it works. Who knows? It might go well. It might not. That's the fun of the thing. Um, but what I'd like you to do is have a go at shouting out the colour of the ink that the word is written in. So various words are going to come up on the screen. And I want you to... Shout out as loud and proud as you can in wherever you are in the world. Um, if you could shout out the colour of the ink that uh, the word is written in. Start, um, so we might need to unmute people a second just so you're not. Oh, that would be good. We could... I know, wouldn't it? Wouldn't yeah, it? So we'll let's go ahead and do that now. Bustling intensifies. Oh, the pressure! <laughs> oh, oh. I should say, if anybody doesn't wish to partake, that's absolutely fine. Just mute yourselves. But it's all good fun. Let me know when we're good, Ed. I reckon give it 30 more seconds. Probably. Okay. Yeah. Participation is building. I know. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> So is everybody ready? Yeah. I reckon, yeah, we're good to go. Maybe 30 is too much. Let's go for it. Okay, cool. So these words are going to pop up and I just want you to simply shout out the colour of the word that the ink is written in. So I'll do it too. Um, quietly so I can hear you. Okay, are we ready? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's go. Or are we? Let's go. <laughs> Blue. blue, green, green red, red, blue, blue, red, 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 blue, Probably pretty easy for most of you because the words were written in the same ink and um, the same colour ink as what the word says. So red is written in the colour red. 
But then as we went through, I did play a bit of a trick on you. It was a bit sneaky. I changed the colour um, of the word. So your brain was kind of confronted with this problem. Do I say the word as it's written or do I use the, the colour? Uh, and this is a really interesting task of cognitive flexibility and how your brain um, chooses to deal with that and how it can change between one rule and another. Um, so this is something that we know people with Huntington's disease struggle with. It's something that we all struggle with if we've not seen it before. Uh, and there's varying um, evidence whether you can train this ability or not. Um, but shall we see if we can do it again? We have slides to do it again. Now you know my devious trick. Yeah, let's go for it. Cool. So it's a bit risky because now you do know the trick, but I'll do it anyway and we'll see um, whether it gets better again. If it doesn't, don't worry, it's fine. Okay, ready? Yes. Let's go. Blue. Blue. Green. Blue. Green. Green. Red. 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 Blue. 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 Red. Red. Green. Green. Blue. 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 Red. 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 Yes. Good work. So I don't know if you got any better or not. Um, sometimes this does work, sometimes it doesn't. But something to do, um, keep your kids entertained, you can get it online, free, freely available, the Stroop test um, to have a little go at. So that is a classic example of what some people might call brain training. But I really wanted to pose at the end of this what I like to call the so what question. So you might get really good at learning how to distinguish blue from red in terms of colours, but is that going to help you in your daily life, particularly if you are suffering from a condition such as Huntington's disease? So the so what question is really paramount for me. It's really key in my mind. Uh, so I was looking specifically in my study at whether doing number puzzles would help people kind of adding up their shop as they went around the supermarket would doing puzzles that were focusing on spatial awareness help them get around and about um, within their home so it really had to be very relevant um, to have any benefit so ultimately i was looking to try and benefit and to help people so that um, was kind of my research that i wanted to um, run you through this evening but uh, I couldn't finish a talk with Huntington's disease without mentioning some really hopeful studies that are ongoing at the moment. So I'll refer to a specific study in a moment, but I think that it's likely that the therapeutic approaches are likely to combine all sorts of different therapies. So not only pharmacological therapies, but non-pharmacological therapies as well. Cardiff's got a great history of looking at things like exercise um, as well to help people living with Huntington's disease. So I think the future probably looks um, quite complex in that it's probably going to be a combination of lots of things um, to try and help people. This is a study that I wanted to draw your attention to. Uh, this was a study that looks at antisense oligonucleotides. I'll tell you a bit more about those um, later. It was a study that was quite widely reported in the BBC News. Uh, this was a study that did, it was an international study. So nine centres, we were involved in Cardiff, um, 46 patients. And the aim of the study was to demonstrate safety and proof of concept of this really experimental drug. Um, initially run by a pharmaceutical company called ISIS for obvious reasons, um, they changed their name to Ionis. And they ran this um, study that looks at antisense technology. So some of you will be probably very familiar um, with a slide like this. It's how our genetic information, our DNA, is made into protein. And in terms of Huntington's disease, the change in the gene causes a change in the mRNA and it makes a bigger protein really. So this drug is designed to bind to that mRNA and to prevent the production of that protein. That's how the drug's designed to work and it's called an antisense oligonucleotide. And this study was really just looking at safety. So that was the, the top line. They just wanted to check this was a, a drug that was safe to use. So that's just another way of saying what I've said before in that this drug is designed um, to bind to the mRNA. Here you can see a representation of the faulty gene in Huntington's disease, this orange bit, it's just made it bigger, just um, expanded that genetic information, which is produced ultimately as a protein. 
But this drug, you can see it's in this purple blob is the drug and um, binding to that mRNA, preventing it from forming that protein. So the study um, reported their results back in December um, of 2017. So it was the same day um, that sadly Keith Chegwin died. So this was the second news item on the BBC News with Hugh Edwards. Yes, Hugh, we love Hugh. Um, but he anchored the new show that gave us all of these um, news stories in relation to the results of this trial. And the results were that the drug successfully lowered the levels of the mutant Huntington protein, which was really uh, good. It was a really beneficial um, study, but it was very small and it was just looking at the safety ultimately. So now what's happened is this study has been extended so that more sites, more places can recruit patients. Uh, the people that were on the study initially, uh, that study's ongoing for them. So because they were in that study originally, it's carrying on for them. And they're recruiting more and more patients to get a bigger sample size so they can generate more meaningful and robust conclusions. This is a figure that I grabbed um, from the paper that reports the results. So there's the reference there for you. But just to run you through this uh, briefly, these are the different doses of that experimental drug. So not only were they looking at safety, they were looking at potential dosing effects. And you can see that the dots are individual patients and the line is an average of how much their mutant Huntington protein was lowered. So you can see there was a placebo group and you can see all of these different doses. And all of the doses, if you look at them all, they all lower the um, amount of that Huntington protein, which is really interesting. And it also looks like there isn't much of a difference between the 90 milligrams and 120 milligrams, which is quite interesting. So this looks really positive. I think it's the most positive um, results or research that we've had out there in Huntington's disease ever, actually, particularly because this is designed specifically to correct, not to correct, but to prevent the protein um, forming, which is the cause of, of the condition. So I think it's really interesting. Um, whilst I think it's really interesting, I think it's really positive. I think there are some interesting discussions, particularly in relation to access of this drug. We can look at other conditions that have used similar anti-sense technologies um, and the drugs have been licensed and patented and it's likely that people will need several doses a year and often a dose is hundreds of thousands of US dollars. So I think that we need to think quite carefully about that um, as well. And then finally, wanted to pick up on this story. This is a story um, that presents some of the really interesting ethical and moral dilemmas that we have in Huntington's disease research world. So this was a woman who was looking to sue her local health boards because she was not informed about her father's positive um, genetic test for Huntington's disease. She went on to conceive a child and she fell pregnant and she was pregnant when she found out that she may have um, the Huntington's disease gene. So she is suing the health board or was suing the health board to say that she should have been made aware of that information. Uh, it's further complicated by the fact that her father um, murdered her mother. Um, so there are lots of layers to this story that she was recently unsuccessful in her legal challenge, which is um, very interesting. This is a really, really complex, yet really interesting dilemma based around individual patient confidentiality versus your responsibility to the wider family unit. And who is the patient? Is your patient just the individual or is that wider family unit? So she was unsuccessful in her claim. But I think that this opens up some really interesting discussions, particularly because um, the, the ruling, the legal ruling is, um, in my opinion, a little bit kind of fluffy. So that's quite interesting as well. And certainly to look into if you're interested. So that brings me to a close. Um, just to say thank you to everyone, to the lovely people that give me money to um, do this research and all of my colleagues um, that I work with and have continued to work with over the years. And that's it from me. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much for a fantastic talk. And um, again, we'll open the floor to questions. I, I have one question. That was a fantastic talk. Thanks very much for, for telling us all about these fantastic topics. 
Um, the the happy the happy neuron thing. Um, I was just wondering if if there's any scope for for something similar for other conditions, and perhaps whether as we go into the digital age, whether we'll we'll start to see things like that possibly even being prescribed by doctors as um, as therapies to patients. Yeah, so I think it's a really interesting one. Um, for me, and particularly in relation to Alzheimer's, so the company that I mentioned who got into a bit of trouble and had huge fines, um, their unsubstantiated, unsubstantiated um, claims were specifically in relation to Alzheimer's disease. So I think that brain training is a really interesting topic. I'm um, a little bit worried about things like access. And for me, there isn't that evidence or body of evidence to show that the things that you train your brain on will transfer into your real life. So you'll probably get really good and, and much better at doing them on a computer. But whether that will transfer into your daily life is another question. So they've done lots of work in terms of Alzheimer's and facial recognition, particularly of loved ones and family members. Um, whether that transfers from a computer screen into reality is a bit of a different question. So I'd be very um, cautious about paying for any brain training. Okay, thank you. I have a question. So what if I wanted, as a healthy individual, a really strong brain? how strong can I make my brain doing brain training games? And I guess, do people who have Huntington see more of a benefit, say, than someone who's healthy? Yeah, so I think it depends on how you define strength. Um, what does a strong brain kind of look like? So there are lots of things, all the kind of classic boring things we know we should do in terms of our general health, drinking water, eating fruits, vegetables, not eating fatty foods and getting exercise and fresh air. Um, in terms of Huntington's disease versus the general population, we know that people with Huntington's disease, their cognitive ability does decrease over time, probably at a greater extent than the regular population. So there's probably more of an opportunity to intervene there. And then I guess it's a question of you as an individual, what do you want to make your brain good at? So we'll all be aware of those people who are really good at kind of cryptic crosswords and things like that, but they might not be so good at other things. Um, so I think there's probably a bit of a trade off there actually, in terms of what elements of cognition or cognitive function that you want your, want to be good at. Okay. 